I was just remembering um, and mentioning to Dr. Wilhoit how I think one of, one of the times I sat here, my memory is sitting over in that corner over there, writing my comprehensive New Testament, Old Testament, to get in, to test out of those classes in the grad school. That was uh, 32 years ago. It was a gorgeous night, so my daughter Natalia set up her painting station on the terrace. A lamp lighting her easel, her brightly colored palette on the beautiful coffee table next to her. Hours later, she finished her painting and carried her easel back into the house, the table she would take care of later. What came later, however, was rain, plenty of it. So when Natalia walked out to the terrace the following morning, intending to carry the coffee table back inside, she was shocked. The table was an absolute wreck. Water had soaked through the thin, varnished surface and swollen the pressed particle board, which expanded and pushed off the sham shell. What had appeared to be a solid piece of wooden furniture was no more than a pretty surface with a cheap inside. When the water came, it fell apart. External appearances and true substance. Sadly, they do not always match. In tonight's Intercultural Studies Gratian Lecture, I invite you to reflect on truth-telling and truth-living as central dimensions of Christian mission in the world today. I suggest that Christian mission is not only a matter of crossing boundaries, culture or otherwise, but of living truthfully as followers of Jesus in God's world, wherever we are. You see, truth in God's dictionary is not some conceptual tenet to which people must assent, an asset one can own, or a sword to be dangled over people's heads. Truth instead is a person who must be reckoned with. I am the way and the truth and the life, Jesus told his baffled disciples in John 14, 6. And, quote, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, John 8, 31, 32. Truth-filled speaking and living are essentially relational be my disciples, and also ethical, if you hold to my teaching. Truth must be known for truth to be spoken and lived. And Jesus, the truth, is only known as far as people sustain a relationship with him through the work of the Spirit. The Spirit guides into all truth those who choose to follow by making Jesus present to those followers so that they may speak and live truthfully as he did, John 16, 12 to 14. What then does it look like to live truthfully into the good news of the community of love amidst the devastation of hurricanes and earthquakes, mass murder and displaced millions, amidst contesting views regarding the underlying causes of these horrors, amidst the storm of media waves churned as they are with claims and counterclaims of news and fake news, what resources can communities of Christ followers draw on to live with integrity in a world of reality, avoidance, and fabricated truths? What role can educational institutions play in cultivating truthful living? Again, what is at stake is a matter of integrity, of truthfulness in relation to reality, 
and of consistency between what is presented publicly and what is privately lived. The story of God's people through the centuries illustrate, illustrates how these two assessments are bound together, and a, a true assessment of reality and a consistency between what is said and what is lived, and how when these are truthful, they result in faithful living, and how their absence undermines Christian witness. The nation of Israel had been carried off into exile. There was suffering and loss. The people had strayed far from God and the laws God had given to ensure good life, provision, and justice for all people. Religiosity, with its proper doctrinal affirmations and its pious rites, had taken the place of just living. And they were experiencing the consequence of their unfaithfulness to God and to one another. Within that scene, some self-appointed prophets were, quote, prophesying out of their own imagination, claiming to speak in God's name, yet demonstrating no concern for the needs of the people. God denounced them through the prophet Ezekiel, saying the following, and you find this in Ezekiel 13. Their visions are false, and their divinations a lie. They lead my people astray, saying, peace when there is no peace. When a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will send hailstones hurtling down, and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, people will not ask you. People will ask, where is the whitewash you covered it with? You see, what was happening is that in pursuit of their interests, these prophets were avoiding reality. They were dressing it up with falsity and misguiding the people not only a matter of words uttered or duties avoided, these men were being untrue to reality, untrue to their relationship with God, and untrue to their own people. They were guided by what Walter Brueggemann defines as royal consciousness, one that is committed to personal satiation and self-satisfaction, is made possible by oppressive social policies and is legitimized by, quote, an official religion of optimism which believes God has no business other than to maintain our standard of living and the king in his palace, end quote. According to this brand of consciousness, good is what favors me. Right is what places me over others. Moral is whatever sustains the status quo that guarantees my privileged condition. Truth need not be told. Death must not be named. Failure must never be confessed. And suffering, fear, and grief must be repressed or at least hidden away. The game must go on. And religion becomes no more than a glossy veneer. By the way, I'd encourage you to read Costi Hinn's recent article in Christianity Today for an inside view of a contemporary version of that game. Centuries later, stepping squarely into the same prophetic tradition as Ezekiel, Jesus confronted the lack of truthful integrity among the religious scholars and theologians of his day. We read as Matthew 23, these warnings of Jesus. The religious scholars, by the way, this is the message version. The religion scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Their lives are perpetual public shows. They love to sit at the head table at church dinners, basking in the most prominent positions, preening in the radiance of public flattery, receiving honorary degrees and getting called doctor and reverend. <laughs> Yet further, 
for these very leaders, our meek and mild teacher has even stronger words. And the text continues, I've had it with you. You are hopeless, you religious scholars, you Pharisees, you theologians and church leaders, you hypocrites, for you tithe meticulously, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. You are hopeless, you religious scholars, you frauds, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup, then the gleaming surface will mean something. You are hopeless theologians and t church leaders. You are like manicured grave plots, grass clipped, flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. External appearances and true substance. Sadly, they do not always match. Jesus denounced the lack of integrity of religious leaders who benefited from the status quo of an economic and religious system that favored a few, strapped most of the population into poverty, and excluded foreigners from the community. Rome demanded taxes, and so did the temple. To make matters worse, the temple, the place meant for all people to draw near to God, had become a shopping center for further profit of its leaders and a public symbol of exclusion. Mark tells the familiar story of Jesus cleaning out the temple, challenging the religious leaders whose walk does not reflect their talk, and we find this in Mark 11. The issue, you see, was not business itself, changing money, selling, and buying, but there were two interconnected problems. First, business was most likely not being carried out ethically. Sellers were probably overcharging the poor pilgrims who had come from afar and had no other option than paying the jacked up prices charged for their temple offerings. Second, business was being carried out in the outer court of the temple, the area that had been designed to welcome foreigners into God's presence. This choice deprived Gentiles from access to worship and belonging. So Jesus' anger was directed specifically at the pious religious leaders, those who should have been guaranteeing that business be clean and that the temple be open to all nations, but instead were personally benefiting from the unjust arrangements. Jesus says, is it not written my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus cited the Hebrew scriptures that his listeners would recognize as words from the prophet Isaiah, and we know as chapter 56, verse 7. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. By citing this text, Jesus was hearkening back to the law given to the people of Israel a law that had made provision for the livelihood of foreigners along with widows and orphans as special recipients of God's favor. A few examples, Leviticus 23, 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them 
for the poor and the foreigner. I, the Lord, your God. Living truthfully under God's sovereignty meant ensuring that sustainability of the people rent the sustainability of the people rendered vulnerable by the society of the day. Leviticus 19:33 When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Living truthfully under God's rule meant setting aside discrimination and offering a wholehearted welcome to foreigners. Leviticus 19.35, do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Living truthfully as citizens in God's kingdom meant conducting honest business and leading just economic practices. Leviticus 24, 22. You are to have the same law for the foreigner as for the native born. I am the Lord your God. Living truthfully into God's kingdom meant ensuring equal rights and responsibilities to all people, regardless of socioeconomic, ethnic, political status, or place of birth. Now, through the law, God made provision to guarantee the dignity and the livelihood of people made vulnerable through loss, deprivation, and humanly constructed borders. The vocation of God's people could be none less. When the people strayed, faithful prophets told the truth, denouncing false readings of reality and lack of integrity and calling Israel back to its mission of living out God's purposes for the whole of creation. Through his life and teaching, Jesus brought this calling to the forefront. Do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, Matthew 5, 7. Jesus highlighted the purpose of his time on earth in relation to God's law. When Rome and temple elites valued people according to ethnicity, social status, and how much they contributed to the coffers, Jesus stepped bold and counterculturally into a prophetic role as a truth teller and truth doer. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It was this truth telling and truth living vocation that prompted Jesus to call out the teachers of the law and to clean out the temple. And he entrusted this very same calling to his disciples when he was getting ready to hand over his ministry to them. John 20, 21, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Same calling, same spirit, the spirit of truth. God's spirit who hovered over the waters, breathing creation into being. God's spirit who inspired and empowered the prophets of old to tear off religious facades and call God's people back to their true mission. God's spirit who anointed Jesus to tell and live the truth of God's love all the way to the cross. That same spirit of truth is in all Jesus' followers today. John 14, 17 says, the world cannot accept him, the spirit, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. The same spirit of truth makes known truth, that is Jesus, God's boundless love made human. 
The spirit of truth makes Jesus present for his followers today so that we too might tell and live the truth of God's love amidst our self-filled, hate-filled, and fear-filled world. Earlier we asked, what does living truthfully into the good news of the community of love look like today? Well, it looks like the prophets. It looks like Jesus. It looks like women and men gathered humbly around God's word, asking tough questions, not settling for pat answers, and allowing the spirit of truth to weave their story into the story of God's good purposes, building bridges between those purposes and the messy world in which we live. It looks like spirit-led men and women following Jesus by putting their own bodies on the line in daring affirmation that no person is more valuable than any other, regardless of gender, place of birth, color of skin. It looks like spirit-led women and men following Jesus by digging under the surface of official stories and single-issue politics and telling the truth about racism, classism, militarism, unjust business practices and structures. It looks like spirit-led men and women following Jesus out of their air-conditioned fortresses of security and responding to the groaning of creation, scorched and flooded by human greed. Finally, we also asked, how can truth-telling and truth-living be cultivated and watered in a world of fabricated truths? Before suggesting three pointers, a word on the man in whose honor this lecture is offered. John Gratian was a cultivator, someone who lovingly tended to the growth of plants, of visions, and most importantly, of people. In his younger years, he tended to people's gardens around Princeton along with his father, I read. Later, he watered the faith of Bible school students in Congo and Kenya, and then nourished vision through his leadership of AIM. Then for decades, here in this very place, he tenderly cultivated the missionary vocation of hundreds of students. In these ways, he contributed to the truthful telling and living of the good news on the part of Christians the world round. Thank God for his ministry. What now about us? What role can educational institutions play in cultivating truthful living? First, I suggest that truth-telling and truth-living coherence between walk and talk and responsible engagement with context begin at home. The integrity and transparency modeled by staff, administration, and faculty speaks louder to students and to the broader community than any confession of faith or written declaration. Our world would have us build a name for ourselves and for our institutions, yet, the more public our ministry, the larger our readership, the broader our scope of influence, the more we are tempted to disassociate, to disintegrate our public from our private persona, to feed our pride with superficial flattery, to neglect to nourish a spirituality of dependence in relation to God, humility in relation to others, and ethical responsibility in the world. Along with the Lord, we follow. We are called to die to self. And no amount of preaching at people will undo the message our lives communicate. Second, I propose it is problematic when teachers build and transmit systems of thought, theological discourses, Instead of facilitating conversations and engaging truthfully with the daily issues of real people on the ground, the 47 guns of the Las Vegas shooter, 
the underlying cause for increased floods and hurricanes, the connection between this country and the violence in Central America and the millions displaced in Syria. When we focus narrowly on any field of knowledge, without drawing the connection with the whole and with the lived experience of people, we deprive them of the opportunity to take responsibility for living truth in the world. When we deliver stale doctrine, we deprive students of the opportunity to experience and read themselves into the story of a God who spoke a beautiful, healthy, productive creation into being, a God who became human and walked among us a God who still today breathes life into the entire creation, a God who yearns to send us out to live God's truth in God's world. Do we really want theological formation to paint thin veneers of religiosity with no ethical teeth? Do we want to build facades of religious and political correctness that dare not challenge the unjust status quo? Are we satisfied with creating an ecclesiastical class with all the trappings of status that will crumble to pieces when the rains of suffering come? Will we settle for the understandings generated within our bubbles of likeness? Or do we want to make ourselves, our institutions, our churches available to the work of the Spirit who has been active around the world, generating truth-filled theology and practice among sisters and brothers outside the centers of power for millennia? Third and finally, as we move from the more personal to the more public, I challenge us all to rethink our politics in light of Christ's resurrection. Believe it or not, affirming that on the third day Jesus rose again is a political confession. Because through his death and resurrection, Jesus unveiled as deceitful the powers of death that held humanity estranged from God, from one another, and from the rest of creation. God's people are called to live in the world as citizens under God's good rule on this side of resurrection. This, too, is political. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not referring to red and blue elephants or donkeys. I'm referring to the undeniable reality that the church participates in the body politics as do all her members. These are times of extreme polarization, political polarization. Social media has turned into a battlefield. Even theology is weaponized. And confusion cripples initiative. The question, as John Yoder frames it, quote, is not whether the Christian should be political or not. The question is rather to sort what is, sorry, the question is rather to what sort of politics the Christian is called, end quote. At stake is not if the church is or not a political force in the world, but what sort of force it chooses to exert in every particular place in time in light of her understanding of the triune God she serves and of the mission which calls her into existence. Political and economic realism that denies people of the freedom to imagine scenarios other than the current ones simply reinforces the status quo and deprives women and men of necessary responsibility for change. As daughters and sons of the Lord of history, we cannot allow our hope to be co-opted by such pessimism. Indeed, truth about reality must be named. At the same time, in Orlando Costa's word, our societies need to know that life and joy are possible on this side of the grave. Death 
and its many crippling dehumanizing expressions does not have the last word. God's victory over death flings open the gates of communal creativity and imagination that have been trapped by fear and squelched by violence. The story of God's ongoing, loving involvement with God's creation are grounds enough for hope. If God in Christ has not given up on the world, neither can we. Rather, with sober, tempered optimism, we can, by God's grace, engage in truthful relations with one another that demand writing whatever hinders those relationships, be it ethnocentrism, racial prejudice, or unjust economic structures. Caring, faithful, trust-filled relationships are at the core of any hope for a better world, and these are a gift from God. In sum, created in God's image and redeemed from death by that community of love, Christ Church is called to be the living, breathing, loving community of truth tellers and truth livers, empowered, built up, and diversely gifted by the Holy Spirit, a new and unlikely community of equals with interdependent relationships of mutual respect and service, and works of justice and peace far beyond its bounds embodying God's mission, prophetically challenging humanly constructed walls, borders, prejudices, and exclusions does entail risk. Truth is not popular in a society blinded by illusions of power and privilege. But for followers of Jesus, the truth, there is no other way. God be with us until your com kingdom comes in full. Amen. We have an opportunity for a Q&A and there are microphones in the aisles. It would be uh, wonderful if you would kind of line up and bring your questions. And uh, we'll do that from down here to make it a little more personal. Because I have the microphone, I'm going to ask my question first. I wondered if you could tell us a story that illustrates what you've been talking about. All right. So we live, um, as I shared with people in chapel yesterday morning, and it was mentioned today, I guess, we live as, my husband James and I live as part of an intentional Christian community in Costa Rica. And um, one of the families that is also a member, another um, member of our community is a family. They are refugees from El Salvador. His brother, um, had a little van, a minivan, and he ran deliveries around town. The gangs um, constantly charged taxes for circulation of anybody and anything that moves. And um, we don't exactly know if he didn't have enough money to pay or he hadn't paid on time, but he was murdered. And then from his cell phone, they started calling Fabio, who lives with us now. They started calling him, extorting, trying to get money from him. Needless to say, the family had to go into hiding, and eventually they came as refugees to Costa Rica. Now, that's not just an isolated case. And one of the issues I brought up in the talk was why what connection is there between this country and the story of Fabio? And some of you may know very well, but some of you probably don't even know that right now, the Northern Triangle of Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, 
are called, not known now as the triangle, northern triangle, but as the triangle of death. Why? Because there are more murders per capita per day than in many, many war zones of the world. Why? Well, back in the day during the Cold War, there were civil wars funded by the fronts of the Cold War. People were being inducted into the army or the guerrillas, if they were from related to the US or to the Soviet bloc. There was fighting, there were weapons, there were many people died, many people fleed, many people came up to this country. Many people sent their kids up into this country and it's still happening just in the last couple years. I think you probably know the stats better than I do, Danny, but I read, I know that in 20, 15, there were 70,000 miners detained at the border. 70,000 miners. Who in their right mind would put a five-year-old, an eight-year-old girl in, on a truck packed up behind bananas or on a train, on the top of a train to come into this country? Somebody, who would do that? Somebody who believes that that is better than staying. Anyway, when these people came up to the US, the young people find themselves in tough situations in US cities, particularly LA. They have to defend themselves from the other ethnic groups in the streets. They form gangs. Since they are undocumented, they get deported. There's nobody, they don't know anybody back in the country they are sent to. So they join the gangs. And this becomes this whole cycle. And the drugs come up, and the weapons go down. And the women got, get trafficked up, and the funding for military um, engagement and police training goes down. And this connection is one people don't even know about. Now that is truth speaking. <laughs> That is telling the truth that's underneath the reality of Fabio and Erika being part of our community in Costa Rica. But it's one that, so it's one that we are, are just uh, deeply familiar with on the receiving end. Um, and the question then is, where is the church on the, on the other end? As I, I listen to you, I couldn't help think of, but think of your mum and dad mm -hmm. and the influence of your late mum and your dad for so many decades. And I couldn't help but feel that what you're saying is coming out of that background as well. Could you share comfortably? Or? Sure. Yes, it's an honor. It's an honor. I've been asked many times, what is it like to be Renee's, Renee Padilla's daughter? And I say, well, you only know half the story because you should ask, what is it like to be Kathy Padilla, Fieser Padilla's daughter? Um, my father is a well-known um, theologian, uh, recognized around the world, written a lot, uh, spoken a lot, taught a lot. Um, but my mother also was a, a force of uh, perseverance and um, we grew up breathing um, deep questions. Uh, we grew up with a home that was open to endless, diverse people. Um, my, we, when I was a teenager, there was a, a girl came into our home whose mother was alcoholic. She lived with us for a year. The following year, another one. And then at one point, even, there was an entire drug addict family moved into our home um, because uh, she, they had both recovered from drugs. 
uh, to an extent. He was doing very well. She was doing very well. But when she had her babies, she went into postpartum depression with twins. He was trying to work. She was depressed, had the twins, started falling back into drugs. He couldn't work if he had to care for his kids. So the solution was five people moved into our home, where there already were seven, um, so that he could go to work and earn a living for his family, and, sh and my mom could chase after um, the mom to make sure she wouldn't get into trouble, and uh, was able to come out of that. And uh, today, they're, well, he's their brother and sister to me. So um, yes, we breathed it, we not just from the books that lined every last wall in our house, um, but with the, with the hospitality, with the ministry um, of both my parents. And uh, really, I think probably what makes or breaks the being the daughter of or the son of a pastor or a missionary is precisely what I was talking about, is integrity or its lack. And the seamless, they were the same people inside the home as they were in the public sphere. And I think that is an incredible gift. I recognize myself as very privileged for that. Uh, doctora, muchas gracias. Um, the talk this evening was the truth of the gospel. And thank you for reminding us and bringing us back to uh, the Lord Jesus and what the gospel is all about. Right at the end, you mentioned Orlando Costas, and, um, and you talked a bit about the cost of truth-telling. And we recall the, um, the great book by Costas, uh, Christ Outside the Gate, and that call to go to him outside the gate. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more. I mean, you've hinted at it or addressed it in this last story. But could you talk a little bit more about the cost? I think there's something in the, uh, in the gospel where we're called to this um, resistance of evil and to favor righteousness and justice and love. But it's, it's a deeply costly thing, um, and it's a dangerous thing to go to him outside the gate. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So um, along the way of life, I've, I expected to grow up in Argentina, have my kids in Argentina, and live in Argentina the rest of my life. I love Argentina. It's, my, it's the place where culturally I am most at home. That was not to be. Um, I lived in different countries for different phases, for different reasons. But um, one of those phases was living in El Salvador for six years. Um, and one of, the, one of the people who exemplifies that following of Jesus outside the gate was a very unlikely figure. He was picked to be Archbishop of San Salvador because he was a safe guy. He wasn't going to challenge much in the turbulent years where he was um, a local parish priest. So he was asked to become the, the bishop and archbishop of um, San Salvador. As he took his role seriously, he did not just sit in the halls of power of the archbishop brick. He went out into the villages. He talked to people. And he felt for people. He followed Jesus outside the gates of power. And what he heard made him speak. And what he spoke were things like preaching that does not denounce injustice is not preaching of the gospel. And he called the military, the army, to stop the violence because they were murdering people right, left, and center in the name of national security and uh, the fight against communism. And as he was ministering, 
to the poorest of the poor and speaking out r radio talks and preaching, calling out for justice as he was ministering the sacrament in, and delivering mass, he was murdered in the chapel as he was administering communion. That, that is an example of somebody who followed Jesus outside the gates and lived, truth lived, and truth spoke. And that was the cost he paid. Now, of course, his, his Archbishop Oscar Arnulfo Romero, and his name has gone down in history, and by now he's in the process. He hasn't already been canonized as a saint um, by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, he, he will get that status, but there are tons of other people <laughs> that will not ever be named. And there's a fantastic book that talks about the mosaic of Romero's life and all the small people who contributed to bringing him to the place he was and for him to step forward as he did. Um, so yes, there is a price. And I think um, our, especially, especially this culture is, is um, privilege and means economic stability allow for so many insulating security blankets, right? You can protect from the climate, you can protect, you have insurances, and you have all these things that can guarantee that things will be okay. And of course they're not, and many people know they're not, um, and especially people vulnerabilized because of their color or their place of birth or whatever, sure, know that things are not secure even here. But there is this sense of false security. Um, people that have lived along with suffering and had to face it and had to grapple with it and had to ask, where are you, God, in the midst of this? And cried out like we looked at yesterday in chapel with Job or cry with Habakkuk, how long, Lord? How long? In a way that comes a little more naturally because life is not safe. So then you don't need to guard it so much. Thank you so much for sharing, I'm so grateful. Um, I wanted to ask a question about both your personal life and professional life, and you've been calling people to move outside of the realm of thinking to a realm of doing. And I think about the fact that you are an academic and a scholar and an author and a theologian and all the, all the terms that can put you in one category. And you're choosing to live out your faith as someone who builds community gardens and who has home that you share with someone else. You mentioned at midnight dinner earlier that you share a common purse, a common pot. You cook food on Tuesday and lead Bible study in your home when you're um, back in the country. That's a way of bridging these worlds. And I'm curious if you can explain to us how you learn to think differently so that you live differently to bridge those worlds, where it's not either I run a community garden and I'm a social advocate, or I'm a theologian and I write about those things and encourage people to do it, what it looks like for you to live into that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I guess I have to point back again to the integrity of, of my family and my home community, uh, my parents, my local church, the Christian student ministry, you know it as InterVarsity here in the US. Uh, InterVarsity is very big and very, um, a lot of staff. In Latin America, the student movements are very grassroots. There's many countries don't even have a paid, one full-time paid staff worker in the whole country. So that makes students themselves the actors and, you know, um, protagonists. So those were my communities, my family, my local church, um, and the Christian student movement. Um, Asociación Bíblica Universitaria Argentina, and by the way, the stewards here were part of the pioneering of those movements and welcomed us. They know me since I was five. So they could probably answer your question maybe even more than I can because they watched me grow up. 
by the grace of God, it's a gift to have them here. But um, so I think it's one is my parents modeled. They were both bright, capable people, um, but they also did did the very grassroots, local, sacrificial, every day, in and out um, stuff. So that was definitely shaped me. But I think also my reading of the gospel, <laughs> my understanding of Jesus and how Jesus lived and, and his, the calls that he made here. I mean, the, the controversies about what does it really mean to live into God's purposes in the world? Um, and so I, can't, I don't even consider myself an academic because I'm, I'm not only a, I don't, I, I can't do that. I have to do this. I have to go back from life into thinking and praying and, and reflecting and, com and having conversations. And um, somebody was asking me today, how do, you, how do you prepare for these things? Well, it's, it's a building. It's building through life and experience and the word and the spirit and people. And so it's, it's, an, it's an always back and forth. It's a dialogical thing. It's, it's not something I do up in some closed up room and you know it's um so yeah the modeling the understanding of of scripture the work of the spirit and a keen awareness of the subtle um enticement of name everybody wants to build stars they're sports stars and political stars and the speaking industry is full of trying to build stars. And it's, a, it's really, I mean, honestly, it's seriously wrought with sinfulness. And so I, I, I wrestle. I mean, I get asked to do this, and I wrestle. Should I do it? I, I don't need to be. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm stealing time from my local community, from my ministry and teaching and everything by doing this. Is this so it's a, it's a, it's a wrestling of, of calling also. And what does God gift each of us for in God's economy? And then where do I fit? Um, but my local community is, is a very significant, intentional antidote to thinking too much of myself because I have to face the fact that Heidi cooks with so much oil and leaves the kitchen so splattered I can't even go in there and I have to deal with it and I'm I'm and she knows me and I know her and we have to find a way to live together so that keeps me more real And I could say that in front of Heidi. She Um, yeah, I think we're, I'm one of five, and I'm the oldest um, in our home. And I would say, and we're four sisters, and the youngest is a brother. Um, I would say of the five, the three oldest are the most passionate for God and God's calling in our lives. And the other two are doing their thing. They're nice and uh, go to church but their lives are not as, I wouldn't say, as on fire in a way. Um, as we were bringing up our kids, the issue of, of space and privacy and need to nourish them uh, was always one we were very, very uh, keenly attentive to. Um, so we made sure we had spaces where they could be, we could just be family, just the nuclear family without everybody else. 
But it, and, um, and we always, when we brought somebody new into the home, checked with the kids, how does this feel? Are you ready? Is it too much? Tried to get it a, a temperature read. And it was fascinating how much they said, you know, we live far from biological family because my family's in Argentina, my husband um, was in Grand Rapids. So they said, you're giving us the an opportunity to have other family. And if there wasn't somebody new coming in every so often, they would say, well, so where's your friend from Africa or from, you know, because we learned so much. So they just really expanded their horizons to have that. But we, it is a sensitive balance. Um, your other question was suffering. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, what can I say? I mean, I think very personally, um, I never, my family was never wealthy or, and you know, my shoes had to last my whole school year because that was my, that was the shoes for that year. Um, and such, but we never felt limited or poor because we had such a rich environment and, and rich relationships. And, um, and so, and I really didn't know deprivation. Um, I didn't have any real reason to suffer. Um, and I came up here to grad school after doing my university in Argentina and eventually married a friend I met here in the grad school, Neil Eldrenkamp, and we began ministry in with IFES, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, the student ministry I was mentioning. Um, we went together to Ecuador. We worked very, very closely together. I wrote scripts, and he uh, put the music to the videos. I, I wrote articles and he designed them for the student ministry. We were really worked together a lot. And um, in a simple carjacking, he was murdered in front of us. And I don't say this to, to, to shock you. I say it because it began a whole new chapter in my life of awareness of God in the midst of suffering it made me aware of my privilege because I was surrounded with love. I was held up by prayer and encouragement and support and meals. And I was so taken care of by the Christian community. And I knew that women get, get, that are widowed and the world round are left in such vulnerable conditions. It just began a whole new read of the gospel, a whole new understanding of the cross and Christ taking on death unjustly. All my theology was shaken up and reshaped uh, through this experience. Um, and it opened me up to so much more awareness of, of suffering throughout uh, uh, scripture and the meaning of the cross and the meaning of going with Paul and saying to me to live as Christ and to die is, is gain. Um, so I think there's a lot um, that the church needs to learn from the church in places of suffering where it's not, um, and especially here where power and culture and Christianity have all been kind of wedded together in a messy um, mix uh, where, you, where cultural Christianity and faith and the cutting edge of a radical prophetic presence are kind of at odds with each other. I think there's a lot to learn from brothers and sisters who have gone through, who continue going through suffering. So God give us grace in that. taking advantage of my position. One last question. As an outsider looking at the American church, <laughs> talking about truth speaking, right? Exactly. And you have an opportunity maybe to have a prophetic word for us. What would you like to say? Yeah, I guess I would look at 
what I where I left off just a moment ago about um, the a critical association of Christianity with power and culture um, is one that can blind to the real core and the subversive power of the gospel um, from from the very beginning it was so you declare the religion of the empire everybody who's a Roman citizen is now a Christian what everybody in America is a Christian what um, and so this this assumption um, that nation and faith are kind of so tied together. Um, I'm afraid it's very detrimental to really living truthfully into the good news of a different kingdom that, that is not a kingdom of this world, that is not defined by these borders that have been so artificially constructed, that is not defined by blue or red or whatever color there is out there. Um, and so um, I think that and what I see happening is that in fear of losing the hegemony of Christians, there are a couple options. One of them is to just build dig deeper trenches and build higher walls and try to define more categorically what faith really looks like and who's in and who's out and keep that very tight because then if you are told this is what you should believe and this is where you should, you know, then you're in and you're safe and there's this fortress mentality. Or there can be a sober um, reckoning with the fact that maybe we're never really meant to belong 100% in any one nation of the world or be absolutely patriotic to and uh, pledge allegiance to any one flag if it's not to the kingdom, to the rule of the only Lord of, of the whole world and of history. Um, and so I think that's the challenge. Um, and it's an opportunity, too, because it's an opportunity for the church to really be the church of Jesus Christ and not the church of America. Um, my kids always, we're, I'm American. I was born in Colombia and grew up in Argentina and live in Costa Rica. We are Americanos from the Americas. We are from the Americas. Um, so you are United Statesians or US Americans if you want. Before we thank our speaker with a round of applause, can we pray for you? Absolutely. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for that all, all that has transpired tonight. I pray that you would protect our sister, that you would give her courage and strength to fulfill the calling that you have upon her life, that truth-telling and truth-living will be her testimony, and it will be seen as... Uh, a testimony to you, to your power, and to your glory. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. We have all kinds of goodies out in the foyer and would love to have further conversation. So let's head that direction and have Chicago popcorn and cookies and drinks.